Okay, so this is a very exciting unit. We're going to talk about photosynthesis. So we're going to see how plants take in air and they can use that to build their biomass. So in other words, they take in carbon dioxide, which is gas, and they incorporate carbon dioxide into their physical, uh, tangible biomass, and that's how they grow. So the photosynthesis reaction involves the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into glucose or sh simple sugars and oxygen. So, and this process is driven by light energy. So um, pigments that are present within thylakoid membranes in plants are going to capture that energy and um, help you facilitate uh, or um, begin the whole process. So organisms that carry out photosynthesis are called photoautotrophs. Examples would be plants, multicellular algae, and unicellular protists, and even cyanobacteria, also called as blue-green algae sometimes because of their color. But, um, but truly, they are bacteria, so they are prokaryotic, and they are the only ones that can be, uh, they can photosynthesize. So in other words, they can produce their own food and release oxygen as a result. So we're going to focus on plants um, and how they convert carbon and water, carbon dioxide and water into sugars and oxygen. So the most active photosynthetic tissue is the mesophyll layer that's found within the leaves of uh, plants. So if you take a leaf and you cut across, you're going to see that mesophyll layer. So you have very tightly compacted cells. So those are called palisade layer and contain lots of chloroplasts. And then not so tightly compacted with lots of little air pockets. So this is called uh, spongy mesophyll. So all of these cells overall contain lots of lots of chloroplasts. And then another structure that's really important here is stomata. So stomata are little pores that can be open or closed and they allow for gas exchange to take place. So they are found mainly on the underneath side of the leaves. So carbon dioxide diffuses in and oxygen diffuses out. So if you take a look at one individual chloroplast, you're going to see that it has a double membrane and then stacks and stacks and stacks of membranous type of structures that we call thylakoids. So thylakoids are important because within their membranes there will be pigments and pigments are known to absorb photons and if they absorb photons that means they absorb light and that energy can be converted into chemical energy which you're going to see later. So since we're talking about photosynthesis we have to understand the nature of sunlight. So basically it's a form of electromagnetic radiation and it comes in waves and it behaves as particles. So these little packets of light energy um, come in and these are called photons. So chlorophyll can absorb the photon, so it can absorb that energy, or they can reflect or transmit. So when we say a molecule absorbs the photon, absorbs the energy, um, the electrons get excited. So it means they jump to a higher shell away from the nucleus, and sometimes they will come down, most of the time, they go back to the ground state, and um, they release that energy as heat or even fluorescence, uh, or fluoresce. And, um, but in certain cases, especially in the, in the case of a chlorophyll, there's a special pair of chlorophylls that are found in the reaction center. They absorb so much energy that they literally lose their electrons. So, and they have to be replenished. So here we're looking at a diagram of um, the range of wavelength of light and different pigments, meaning where in what range do they absorb the best. So if you want to examine that diagram, that would be great because this will help you understand that not every single pigment is going to be absorbing the same wavelength. And there's a reason why they distribute in different ways. So the visible light that we can actually see with our own eyes can be separated by a prism and then you can see the different colors like the colors of the rainbow. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, uh, the longer the wavelength, lower the energy. And in the case of the chloroplast, notice white light is absorbed, so you have all these different colors, um, but green is reflected, so it means green is not going to be uh, utilized to carry out work. We have other pigments besides chlorophyll A that mainly provides, that provides plants their green color because that's what they reflect. So these other pigments are called accessory pigments. So we have chlorophyll B that reflects yellowish greenish color and carotenoids 
that reflect reddish oranges and yellow color. So, and those are usually visible in the fall. Think about the fall leaves, how beautiful those colors are, because the chlorophyll A typically dies at lower temperatures. So all these other colors or pigments have the opportunity to show through. So why these accessory pigments? What's the importance? It serves as for or, uh, photo protection. So we can sort of distribute that energy and dissipate some of it and then broaden the color of spectrum, um, the color spectrum for photosynthesis. So it means we can absorb um, quite good amount of um, uh, energy. So what does um, chlorophyll A look like? What is its chemical structure? So here it is. You're looking at this ring and then there is a magnesium ion in the center. And they have also this hydrocarbon tail, which is hydrophobic, and it's perfect because it's going to be embedded in a thylakoid membrane. And these guys are going to serve like little antennas to capture sunlight. So this is an example of chlorophyll A. And then if we take this methyl group and replace it with aldehyde, we would get chlorophyll B. So if you remember, it will give you a slightly different color. This slide is really your roadmap of where we're going to go and what we're going to discuss. So if you ever get lost in the details, you should come back here and take a look. And you can see that there are two main stages of photosynthesis, so light reactions and also carbon reactions. So what happens in the light reactions? Light energy is absorbed, and all of this is happening within the thylakoids, thylakoid membrane, and um, water is split. So water is going to be split into hydrogen, electron, and oxygen. So oxygen is going to leave as waste product. Electrons and hydrogen are going to be captured by electron acceptor molecule, which is NADP+, and will get reduced into NADPH. Also, the hydrogen gradient will drive the production of ATP through ATP synthase. It's going to be spinning just like you saw in mitochondria during cellular respiration. So those two high-energy molecules are used to power Calvin cycle. Now, Calvin cycle takes place within the stroma of this chloroplast, and carbon dioxide will be diffusing into the chloroplast at this point, and the carbon from the CO2 will be incorporated into the glucose molecule. So, if glucose has six carbon atoms, that means we need six carbon dioxide molecules to diffuse to produce one glucose. After the cycle is complete, notice we return NADP+, the electron carrier now is acceptor, um, and add ADP molecule back to the light reactions so that we can continue the process as long as we get water and light. So let's take a look at more detail of what happens in light reactions. As I said before, it takes place within the thylakoid membrane, so you have this system embedded in the membrane. So you'll see photosystem 2, photosystem 1, and there's an electron transport chain, that's one, and then there's a tiny one, the second one right here. And this would be your ATP synthase, the one that's driven by proton gradient, the one that spins and generates ATP. And you can see at photosystem 2, there is an enzyme that helps um, with photolysis of water. So water is split, oxygen released, electrons are captured, and hydrogen, electrons going to be going down the ETC. So we're going to look at more detail and see how everything connects in the next. But first, um, we need to discuss the photosystem. How are those photosystems organized? So photosystems are basically light harvesting complexes because they have uh, pigments within them. So they act like little antennas to capture light. Besides the pigments, you're going to see protein that's embedded. So in other words, you have this protein complex with the pigments. That's your photosystem. So we have photosystem two and photosystem one. So, and then uh, one very important part in the photosystem is the reaction center. Because in the reaction center, this pair, chlor pair of chlorophyll molecules are going to receive the energy that's passed down from the adjacent chlorophyll. And then also, their electrons are going to get so excited that they're going to be donated to the first primary electron acceptor in the ETC. So this picture shows you what's going on. Again, the photons are absorbed by chlorophyll, and the energy is passed down from one to the next, and finally, the energy is or is passed down to the reaction center chlorophyll molecules. And this is where electrons get so excited, they jump to high energy levels and then are donated to electron acceptor. This is that first molecule in the ETC. So in other words, this molecule is going to become reduced because it accepts electron. So, and um, now the question is, 
if this is photosystem 2, how are we going to replenish the lost electrons? And I'm going to tell you the answer is this. Water is going to be oxidized again, and the electrons are going to be replenished that way. Because remember, we discussed that there is photolysis happening within the photosystem 2. So if we put everything together, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, remember all of this is happening within the membrane of the thylakoid. So this time your protein is colored in color purple. And these are your pigment molecules like chlorophyll. So you can see the light is being absorbed and the light, uh, the light energy is passed on from chlorophyll to chlorophyll until it reaches the reaction center chlorophyll molecules. So because the water was split, this is going to serve, those electrons are going to serve to replenish the lost electrons. So let me, let me back up a little bit. Notice the water is split into three things, electrons, oxygen, and hydrogen. So oxygen leaves, diffuses out of the cells through those pores, and then we're going to hold on to hydrogen, and electrons begin their journey down the ETC. So electrons are going to be passed down to the primary electron acceptor, and they're going to be going through redox reactions. And then when this is happening, this main cytochrome complex, which is hydrogen pump, is going to be activated, and it will pump hydrogen into the inside of the thylakoid, which is called lumen. Finally, electrons arrive to the photosystem one, and the light is going to re-energize those electrons. So electrons are going to jump to higher energy levels again, and will go down the second electron transport chain, except this time they are going to be um, passed on to NADP+, plus. and therefore NADP+, plus is going to be reduced into NADPH, and NADP+, plus reductase is going to facilitate this reduction process. So here's a drawing, or here's another drawing of the thylakoid, and I love it because you can see everything in greater detail, and it kind of all comes together. So this is your thylakoid membrane. You recognize phospholipids. And there's lots of lots of lots of them. And then this is the inside of the thylakoid, which is called lumen, and then the outside, which is your stroma. But everything is within the chloroplast. So again, we're looking at photosystem two, and here's photosystem one. And then the water is split by an enzyme at photosystem two. The light is absorbed, electrons get excited, and they get passed down the ETC. Cytochrome complex gets activated, and it actively pumps hydrogen into the lumen of thylakoid. We generate this high concentration gradient of hydrogen. We create what's called proton motive force. That's going to drive the ATP synthase because the hydrogen are going to diffuse through the channel and activate this catalytic domain of this ATP synthase. This is where phosphorylation of ADP into ATP is going to take place. Why do we need ATP? We're going to use ATP to, Calvin, uh, to power Calvin cycle. So at the end of this um, chain of ETC, when electrons arrive to photosystem one, the light is going to be re-energizing them again. And this time, they're going to be passed down to the NADP+. So NADP+, is your electron acceptor molecule. NADPH is your electron carrier molecule. So which one do you think would have higher energy levels? Well, yes, NADPH. And that's why we're going to use that molecule to power Calvin cycle as well. One thing I wanted to point out is that what you saw in a previous slide was um, linear on non-cyclical electron transport. And you saw two photosystems, photosystem two and then photosystem one. So in addition to linear electron transport, uh, plants also have what we call cyclic electron transport. And you notice it only uses photosystem one and it produces only ATP. So what happens here is that electrons get passed down to the photosystem one they get re-energized. But this time, they're not going to be passed down, donated to NADP+, but instead they're going to be returned back to go through the cytochrome complex one more time. So when the cytochrome complex is activated, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to pump more hydrogen into the inside of the thylakoid. Therefore, because of chemiosmosis, we'll be able to generate more ATP. So this is perfect because Calvin cycle, as you're going to see later, uses more ATP than NADPH. So this process ensures the production of extra ATP that Calvin cycle needs.
let's recap light reactions. What do we see here happen? We had thylakoid membranes, first of all, that was the location, and then we had water that split, we released the oxygen, we generated NADPH, ADP, and then um, the overall purpose of light reactions would be to convert solar energy, radiant energy, into chemical energy. What chemical energy? In the form of ATP and NADPH. Okay, and now we're going to discuss the next phase of photosynthesis, and that would be Calvin cycle, also called carbon cycle, also called dark reactions. But what happens in here is just basically sugar production. This is where we're going to use ATP and NADPH generated in the light reactions and also incorporate carbon dioxide that's coming from the air to produce a three carbon sugar. And then I'm going to tell you right away that three carbon sugar does not make up a glucose molecule because glucose has six carbons in, in the molecule. So it means you'll have to combine two of them to produce one glucose. So Car uh, Calvin cycle has basically three main phases. So we have carbon fixation, reduction in sugar production, and regeneration of rubulose bisphosphate. So let's take a look at that very first phase, what we call carbon fixation or uptake. So we have a pre-existing compound, which is rubulose bisphosphate, RUBP, that's already present in the stroma of chloroplast. So here comes the CO2, one at a time, and notice Rubisco, which is an enzyme, is going to incorporate or fix that incoming carbon. So now we had five carbon atoms in RUBP, and now notice we have six. So this molecule is very short-lived and is going to split in half. So it splits in half, so it splits into three carbon molecules. So only one is shown, but you can visualize there it would be another one. So what happened here? CO2 came in as gas, and now the C became a part of the compound, the physical, tangible matter. So what happens in the next step is basically the reduction phase and sugar production. So we can immediately see that ATP is used and NADPH. And if you recall, ATP and NADPH molecules were generated in the light reactions. So this is a very simplified diagram and sort of summarizes the big picture, but you can take a look at one of the steps here and see ATP was hydrolyzed and the third phosphate was used to phosphorylate three phosphoglycerate. Do you see it? We had one phosphate right here and now we have the addition of phosphate. So there it is. So it means we extracted that energy. So as we go through the process to make the sugars, um, we, we would see the modification of these chemical compounds addition of phosphate, removal of phosphate, cleaving and putting things together. And, and here we're using NADPH. So we're extracting these electrons and we are converting these molecules all the way down into G3P, which is going to be that sugar, that output. So remember, as I said before, we would need two of them to form a six carbon sugar molecule. So most of these molecules are retained um, in the cycle to be able to regenerate RUBP. So this is this would be your third step or third phase. Um, and you can see we use the ATP again, and we have lots of different steps behind that are not shown in this diagram. And the examining chemical reactions here and mod chemical modifications would be beyond the scope of this class. So we regenerate RUBP so that way we can incorporate another CO2 that's coming in. So the cycle will continue six times because you incorporate one CO2 at a time and you need six of them to produce one glucose. All right, you see, that wasn't that bad, right? So let's recap carbon reactions. So it means those reactions took place in the stroma of chloroplast. We formed sugar, so we used CO2 and incorporated into the sugar molecules. The carbon was incorporated. And... ATP and NADPH that were generated in light reactions were actually utilized to carry out these different reactions. And then ADP and NADP plus are sent back to light reactions so we can recycle them in a way. All right, and the last part that I want to mention is here's your overall photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis equation. It looks very simple, don't you think? But now you know better that there are lots of different reactions taken behind the scenes. And here's carbon dioxide. You saw that play the role in Calvin cycle. 
here's water. You saw that in light reactions. It was split um, into oxygen, hydrogen, electrons. And then you see glucose that was made in Calvin cycle. And we utilized the C from the carbon dioxide to make this glucose molecule. And then oxygen that was released because of the water that was split. So you see how everything comes together. So keep in mind that plants do not build just sugars. They don't build just glucose. They can actually convert the glucose molecule into other organic compounds. They have to build proteins. They have to build fats and lipids. Um, so where would they get nitrogen? Where would they get phosphate groups or phosphorus? What do you think? Because think about it. If the plant cells are dividing, they would have to copy DNA, and DNA has phosphorus in it. So where would you get it from? not getting it from the air, not getting it from the carbon dioxide because you only have C and O in there. So yes, the plants will pick up those minerals from the soil. So rich soil is very important in plant growth.